Hello and welcome. You're watching New Central TV. I am Judith at TV. Here are the stories making headlines beyond the continent. Let's begin by telling you that the last 12 months have all been over the critical threshold of 1.5 degrees of global warming. Now, this is according to a new analysis of temperature data. Copernicus, the EU's climate monitoring service, says global average temperatures from June 2023 to May 2024 were 1.63 degrees above the 19, the 1850s and the 1900s pre-industrial baseline. Now, in the analysis, a short-term annual breach is not the same as global warming remaining consistently uh, above 1.5 degrees compared to the average of pre-industrial times that global climate negotiations are trying to avoid. The findings come as the World Meteorological Organization warns at least one of the next five calendar years will also exceed 1.5 degrees or warm of warming. The World Meteorological Organization reports today that there is an 8% chance the global annual average temperature will exceed the 1.5 degree limit in at least one of the next five years. In 2015, the chance of such a breach was near zero. And there is a 50-50 chance that the average temperature for the entire next five-year period will be 1.5 degrees higher than pre-industrial times. The truth is, almost 10 years since the Paris Agreement was adopted, the target of limiting long-term global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius is hanging by a thread. The truth is, the world is spewing emissions so fast that by 2030, a far higher temperature rise would be all but guaranteed. And for more on this, I'm joined by our international correspondent, Afia Hagen. Afia, uh, does this mean that there has been a breach of the uh, Paris Climate Change Agreement, which underpins the need to, uh, the, to keep the Earth's warming below 1.5 degrees? Well, it doesn't mean that there's been a breach of the Paris Climate Change Agreement yet. And that agreement saw 200 countries uh, sign an agreement which meant they would keep uh, global warming under 1.5 degrees. Now, that 1.5 degree threshold is very important because if the Earth warms more than 1.5 degrees, then you have more drastic effects on the climate. So more droughts, more flash floods, more terrible storms, more hurricanes, things like that. 1.5 degrees is seen as that threshold. Now, even though this year has been one of, one of the warmest on record and years are getting warmer, um, this... Seems we've lost you, Afia, there for a second. Afia Hagen, our international correspondent, We'll try to make connection back with her on that story. Afia, are you back now? Afia Egan, are you there? Yeah, I can hear you. Fantastic. Please carry on. We lost your connection for a second there. Yes, I was saying that the Paris Climate Change Agreement actually takes uh, kind of an average over the past decade. And that decade, that average tells us that the Earth has warmed over this past decade 1.2 degrees, so not quite in breach of the Paris Climate Change Agreement yet. And and, and the world's uh, fossil fuel uh, industries should be banned from the advertising to help save the world uh, from climate change. The head of the United Nations have said this. Uh, how would this work if they're going to be, if it's advising that they be banned? Well, yes, it's quite a strong statement there from the UN chief, Antonio Guterres. 
who said that coal, oil and gas corporations are the godfathers of climate chaos, who distorted the truth and deceived the public for decades. And he compared uh, the oil and gas industry uh, to smoking and saying that smoking was unhealthy, so advertising uh, for cigarettes has been banned uh, in certain countries. So why don't we do the same for oil and gas? Now, he said, and I quote, we must directly confront those in the fossil fuel industry who have shown a relentless zeal for obstructing progress over decades. He said many in the oil, gas and coal industries had shamelessly greenwashed with lobbying, legal action and massive advertising campaigns. And he went on to say, I urge every country to ban advertising from fossil fuel companies. And he urged media and tech companies to stop taking fossil fuel advertising. Now, fossil fuel producers have been approached for comment. They don't have any at the moment. Um, uh, but this has no legal standing. The UN has no means of enforcing this idea whatsoever. But it will be seen as a boost for campaigners who, you know, have long said that this kind of advertising should be banned. Mm -hmm. Um, when one hears climate change, it, it always feels like it, it's all bad news. But is it really all bad news when it comes to climate change? And that's a really good question, you know, this definitely seems like there is a lot of doom and gloom around when we talk about climate change. Like I said, it's not all bad. I mean, the Earth has only warmed 1.2 degrees and not 1.4 five degrees as previously thought and we also know that um we aren't as emitting as emitting excuse me as much fossil fuels as we have done in the past uh, so if we go into 2020 500 billion tons of carbon dioxide was being emitted now um we have about 200 billion tons of carbon dioxide uh, being emitted so in four years we've more than half the amount of carbon dioxide that is being emitted into the atmosphere. So things are getting better. However, uh, climate change still continues and the earth still continues to warm. So we need to have concerted efforts to make sure that the warming doesn't go over that, that really uh, pinnacle mark of 1.5 degrees. Mm. Afia, many thanks for doing this with us. Our international correspondent, Afia Hagen. We'll move away from that now and this time on to Southeast Asia where China has warned the United States against stoking ideological confrontation after Washington's top diplomat, and that's Antony Blinken, vowed to never stop promoting human rights in China 35 years after the bloody crackdown in Tiananmen Square. She called on the U.S. to stop interfering in China's internal matters or affairs under the pretext of human rights. Now, this comes after Chinese troops and tanks forcibly dispersed peaceful protests in Beijing's Tiananmen Square on June 4th, 1989, quelling huge week-long demonstrations demanding greater political freedoms. Ichungu 35 years after the brutal crackdown in China's Tiananmen Square, 300 Chinese residents of Toronto have staged a protest in front of the Chinese consulate. China meticulously censors any mention of the 1989 student uprising and veterans are commemorating the anniversary overseas. In the meantime, the United States has promised to never stop promoting human rights in China 35 years after the bloody crackdown in Tiananmen Square as the protest movements exiled leaders pleading for action to help keep the memory alive. Up in China, and I barely knew about the Tiananmen Square massacre before immigrating to Canada. The Chinese communist regime does such a great job to cover it up and pretend like nothing has ever happened in Beijing in the year 1989. But our presence here today is the evidence 
that they have failed. And today we are still here to let the CCP know that we have never forgotten about those who gave their lives for freedom in China. For the past decades, this regime has been using the most despicable tactics against us and our fight for freedom with their civilians, their intimidation, and their... President Seren Zhou weeps, says Pao Lao, one of Taiwan's few diplomatic allies, had suffered a major cyber attack pointing the finger at China. Pao Lao is one of just 12 states worldwide that diplomatically recognize self-ruled Taiwan, which China insists is part of its territory. Recall that on Monday, Taipei said it was ready to help Pao Lao beef up its digital defenses after the New York Times reported that more than 20,000 documents were stolen from Pao Lao's uh, government. Whips on Wednesday said the documents were taken in March soon after Pao Lao signed a new 20-year economic and security deal with the United States. Of course, we're in a world where uh, we're not only threatened by climate change or security issues, now it's cybersecurity. And uh, this is really the first uh, major attack that we've seen on government records. It was into our Ministry of Finance. But uh, what we have learned is that it's, it's of course, ransomware that was probably developed uh, in Russia. Uh, it was sent out of Malaysia. Uh, and it looks like it has ties back to China. The reason we, we say maybe there's government involvement because they weren't interested in money. They really didn't demand any money. Uh, and that's why it's, it's very interesting. It's more harassment than anything else. And, and so uh, the conclusion we get is, is, is maybe there's other motives. In there. A group of Cambodian environmentalists addressed in morning clothes on Wednesday boycotted their trial for plotting against the government the latest legal crackdown on the country's green activist. Ten campaigners from Mother Nature, one of Cambodia's last environmental activism groups, are facing jail sentences of five to ten years if convicted in the plotting case, the details of which are unclear. Five of them wearing morning outfits of all white gathered at barricades outside the courthouse as the trial resumed on Wednesday. They refused to go inside after security guards blocked journalists and their supporters from gathering at the entrance to monitor their trial. And watching New Central TV, more headlines beyond the continent after the break. Stay with us. Third has commemoration has led commemorations to mark the 80th anniversary of the World War the World War II D-Day landings, joining British veterans, other senior royals, and political leaders. The commemorations featured readings, music, reenactments from the period, and recollections from D-Day veterans. The 75-year-old monarch, who only recently resumed public engagements as he battles cancer, spoke at a remembrance event in Portsmouth uh, on England's south coast, organized by the Ministry of Defense. Later, it is a near impossible task 
to imagine the emotion of that day. It is our duty to ensure that we and future generations do not forget their service and their sacrifice in replacing tyranny with freedom. I always considered myself one of the lucky ones that survived because so many of us didn't. Dutch far-right leader Gert Wilders make a quick stop at a market in The Hague a day before European ele elections get underway where he urged voters to cast their ballots for his Freedom Party. Now, during the stop, he took some selfies with supporters, but his visit was interrupted by pro-Palestinian supporters who were attending a commemoration of people who came to the Netherlands from Surinam. The, the 2024 European Parliament election is scheduled to be held from 6th to the 9th of June. Now, this will be the 10th parliamentary uh, election since the first direct elections in 1979 and the first European Parliament election after Brexit. Now, this election will also coincide, coincide with a number of other elections in South in some European Union member states. Ga alsjeblieft mogen stemmen. En liefst natuurlijk op mijn partij. En, maar niet liefst natuurlijk op mijn partij. Maar, eh, en dat kan nog. Timmermans of de PVV, dat is de vraag die mogen geld of zijn stembeleid. Staat of niet, dat is helemaal niks. Dat is zijn beleid, zijn ideeën. Meer immigratie, meer asiel voor Timmermans. Of zorgen dat we allemaal strenger worden zoals de PVV. Dat is de vraag die mogen bij de mensen worden. Nou ja, we hebben bijvoorbeeld onze maatregelen die we hebben in het hoofdlijnrapport hebben opgesloten. Voor sommigen nu heb je daar ook een wijziging nodig van de Europese richtlijnen. Nou, dat zou heel mooi zijn, hè? de kwalificatierichtlijn, de opvangrichtlijn, allemaal het Europees recht. Nou, die moeten aangepast worden, dat zou geweldig zijn. Nou, we hebben ook iets staan voor de langere termijn als een opt-out. Ook daar heb je Europa voor nodig, met, met verdragswijziging, unanimiteit. Maar ook daar helpt het als partij als voor ons de grootste zijn. Ja, kijk, ze willen een streng beleid in Europa. Uh, maar ja, wat, ja, ik hou ook wel van een beetje. Kijk, ik ben ook een beetje streng opgevoed, maar wel netjes opgevoed. Dus ik hou van streng. En uh, ja, 10, 12 jaar geleden zouden we denken: van ja, we zouden niet uh, op wilde stemmen. Weet je, van alles uh, en nog wat. En uh, ik ben ook sinds de laatste jaren pas bezig eigenlijk met stemmen. Vroeger stemde ik eigenlijk ook nooit. Maar ik wil gewoon een beetje normaal Europa, dat iedereen normaal weer met elkaar omgaat, dat het weer bij te betalen is. Waarom moet er een persoon... Dat wilde heeft heeft to come here today and stand in the square and take up all this space. There is a lot of media attention. First, because the media is coming for us to acknowledge our history. Our history of forced labor, of colonialism. But Wilders is taking up all the space like he does all the time. He's not here for the people. If he would really be here for the people, he would also... Italy's Prime Minister, Giorgia Meloni, has announced the completion of the first facility for migrants in Shanjin, Albania, uh, together with her Albanian counterpart, Edi uh, Rama. Under a controversial deal between Rome and Tirani, Albania has agreed to take in asylum seekers plucked from the seas of Italy, register them at a center on the Adriatic Sea, and then house them at another center inland while their claims are processed. According to Meloni, the agreement could be replicable in many countries and also become a part of the structural solution for the European Union. The centers to be managed by Italy can hold a maximum of 3,000 asylum seekers at any one time. Oggi, a sette mesi dalla firma dell'accordo, siamo qui per annunciare il completamento della prima struttura, quella nella, nella quale ci troviamo di Shenzhen. La struttura nella quale ci troviamo assolverà le funzioni tipiche dei centri di prima accoglienza, cioè gli hotspot, che uh, chiaramente ci sono anche in Italia, che sono dedicati ai migranti che vengono so soccorsi e sbarcati. Qui quindi si è al porto di Shenzhen. Potranno sbarcare, come pure abbiamo già detto, solamente migranti salvati in acque internazionali eh, da navi italiane, mentre non saranno portati in Albania soggetti vulnerabili, ovvero minori, donne, anziani, persone fragili. L'altra struttura di Giadera avrà anche funzioni di CPR 
e quindi a Jader verranno trattenuti i migranti ai quali è stata negata la protezione internazionale, quindi che non hanno titolo a entrare in Italia in Europa in attesa del rimpatrio e all'interno della struttura ci sarà anche un'area dedicata alla detenzione dei migranti che dovessero portare. Lawyers has been reacting to an Italian court's reconviction of Amanda Knox of slander for accusing an innocent Congolese man of killing a British roommate in 2007, a murder she herself was jailed for before being acquitted. Knox was sentenced to three years, already served, for having accused, during police questioning, Patrick Lumumba of murdering 21-year-old Meredith Catcher. Knox's lawyers say they are likely to appeal the decision after reading the detailed verdict, while Lumumba's uh, represent, uh, representation, I beg your pardon, welcomed the verdict. La Knox è molto amareggiata, ha preso con sconforto questa, questa decisione negativa, pensava di poter mettere un punto fermo a questa vicenda dopo tutti questi anni e comunque, ripeto, dobbiamo leggere le motivazioni. Sì, ovviamente dobbiamo leggere le motivazioni ma quasi certamente perché questa, quello che giudichiamo un errore giudiziario dovrà eh, diciamo essere sanato e quindi leggeremo le motivazioni ma sicuramente eh, andremo davanti alla Corte di Cassazione. E che è stata ribadita la colpevolezza di Amanda Knox quale autrice del delitto di calunnia. Amanda Knox è la calunniatrice di Patrick di Alumumba. Posso chiedere la forma? È stata condannata a risarcire anche... Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has held a special cabinet meeting to mark Jerusalem Day. The provocative Jerusalem Day parade by thousands of Jewish nationalists celebrates Israel's capture and occupation of East Jerusalem and its holy sites in the 1967 war, a move that is not internationally recognized. It is often marred by violent clashes between marchers and Palestinian residents of the old city, as well as anti-Arab hate speech and vandalism of Palestinian property. After weeks of unrest in 2021, Netanyahu ordered the parade route for men to be changed at the last minute to avoid the main Thora affair in the Muslim quarter, but violence on the day still contributed to the outbreak of an 11-day war between Israel and Hamas. And that's all on Beyond the Continent. Now remember that you can send us your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number now showing on the screen. And whilst you're at it, make sure to follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can also watch New Central live on DSTV Channel 422, South Time Channel 274, Avo TV, and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Judith, a TV.